Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambud. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Supremely Enlightened One. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Namo Buddhaya. Venerable Bhante, meritorious lay disciples. Today, we have the opportunity to come together and do something extraordinary. In this Blessed One's dispensation, we need to understand that there's ordinary things in the world and extraordinary things, that there's normal things and things that, that go beyond this ordinary world. So today, it's a weekend, and many people throughout the city get together for many different reasons, don't they? They get together and watch um, hockey games, maybe, sports things, right? get, for, get together for parties, people's birthdays, Right, weddings, things like that. So there are many reasons that people gather together. But what we're doing today, we're gathering together for a very special reason. This gathering together that we're doing today, it's not connected with the ordinary things of the world. Right? So what are ordinary things? People are born and people get together to celebrate a birth. Uh, people die, people get together to, to mourn someone's death, people get married, get together for very ordinary things. This is, this is part of this long round of samsara. Uh, no matter how many times you get together to celebrate someone's birthday, people keep having birthdays again and again. It doesn't put an end to having birthdays, does it? But this gathering that we're doing today, this helps us put an end to this round of samsara. It's a very special thing. It's not something ordinary in this world. Even, even the heavenly realms, most of the heavenly realms are just ordinary places. They're very special, lots of excellent sensual pleasures, but they're still connected with this round of samsara. Beings born there will always pass away. And from most of the heavenly realms, they'll be reborn in the lower realm, maybe another heavenly realm, sometimes even in the hell realms. So today we're going to listen to a very beautiful sutta where the Supreme Buddha teaches us the difference between the special things that are not connected with continuing this round of samsara and, and ordinary things in this world. So this sutta is called the Anuttaraya Sutta, unsurpassed things. So this word unsurpassed, this is a very special word. So normally in the world, uh, when you read advertisements, they'll tell you this is the best meal you'll ever eat. This is the best vacuum cleaner you'll ever buy. This is the best car you'll ever drive. So uh, those people that are trying to sell you things, they're telling you nothing is better than this. This is the best that you're going to find. So that's what, that's what this word unsurpassed means. So these people, they're very tricky, right? Because they know that, that next year they're going to come out with another car and they're going to say, oh, this is the best car, right? Or this is the best cell phone. You know, don't think about what we told you last year. Right? Forget that. Now we've really found the best one. And when you buy this, then you really are going to be happy. Maybe you weren't totally happy with the last car that we sold you, but this one, for sure, this one will bring you happiness. So in the world, people try and use these, these terms, like the best, nothing better than this. But the Supreme Buddha taught us that there really are things in this world that are better 
than, than ordinary things. So the Supreme Buddha taught, he said, bhikkhus, there are these six unsurpassed things. What six? The unsurpassed sight, the unsurpassed hearing, the unsurpassed gain, the unsurpassed training, the unsurpassed service, and the unsurpassed recollection. Then he asks the monks, so what is this first one? What is this unsurpassed sight? So the Supreme Buddha teaches, uh, say for example, someone goes to see uh, the elephant gem, the horse gem, or the jewel gem. You know, do you know what these are? The elephant gem, the horse gem, the jewel gem? Okay. I don't think we have these in Toronto. So you can't go, you can't go to see these special things. So do you know what a wheel-turning monarch is? So uh, there are two very special people uh, in this round of samsara. One is a Supreme Buddha, a Sama Sambuddha. And another very special person is this wheel-turning monarch. Now the wheel-turning monarch, he's very special in a lot of ordinary things. He does uh, rule the world without violence. He teaches people to follow the precepts. So he's a very righteous king. So that's very special about him. But this, uh, this wheel-turning monarch, he isn't able to teach people how to put an end to this round of samsara. But because of the merit that he's done in the past, he gets to experience excellent treasures, excellent sensual pleasures in this world. And so some of those are this, this elephant gem, the horse gem, and the jewel gem. So these are uh, kind of the best elephant that you can imagine. So nowadays we want to have the best car, but uh, this wheel-turning monarch, he would have the most excellent kind of elephant to ride around in, uh, to take him into battle if he had to, to fight in a battle. And the same with the horse and he would have very special uh, jewels. So when a wheel-turning monarch uh, is ruling a world, people love to go and see the wheel-turning monarch because they get to see all these special things that only appear in the world when a wheel-turning monarch uh, is alive. So he says there are these, this is one kind of sight, uh, this elephant gem, horse gem, and the jewel gem. Or they go to see uh, various kinds of sites. So uh, when your family comes and visits you from Sri Lanka, here in Toronto, where do you take them? Niagara Falls, right? So that's a kind of site, isn't it? So uh, when, you, when you're in the airport, you can see they have a whole wall full of little brochures, right? sites to see, uh, places to go visit interesting things to look at. So this is, these are other examples of ordinary things in the world, sites to go see. The Supreme Buddha says, uh, another kind of ordinary sight is they go to see ascetics and Brahmins of wrong views, of wrong practices. So we know in the time of the Supreme Buddha, there were many, many people who had uh, left the household life and wandered around teaching all sorts of things, uh, many, many wrong views. So uh, these teachers of wrong views, they would teach people things like, uh, there's no such thing as your mother and your father. You don't have any special relationship to these people. They're just like anyone else in the world. They would teach that there's no benefit from giving things, from sharing things with other people. They say the only difference is now you don't have it. Right? If you give something away, you've lost out. They would, and sometimes they would even teach very extreme things. Like they would start out okay. They would say, okay, so this body, it's made up of uh, the elements, right? the earth element, the air element, the wind element. Uh, so far, so good. And then they would say, so it's just these elements. And if you were to take a sword, and cut off someone's head, all you're doing is putting this sword through the earth element, through the air element, through the space element. Right? Started to sound all right at the beginning, but then you end up with this. 
right? Can you imagine that someone would teach? Yeah, if you if you cut off someone's head, you haven't really killed anyone because the elements are still there, right? And that's what they are. So it's okay. Don't worry about it. Does that help you put an end to this round of samsara? Absolutely not. No. You can end up in very bad places because of that. So some people go and see teachers like this. So the Supreme Buddha says, these are different kinds of seeing. I don't deny that. These are, these are sights. These are things to go see. Then the Supreme Buddha says, but this seeing is low, common, worldly, ignoble, and unbeneficial. It does not lead to detachment, to disenchantment, to dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. So these things, they're all connected with the ordinary world. They're not connected with putting an end to this round of samsara. So they're ignoble. So this is a very important word. We know what is it that the Supreme Buddha taught us, these four things that are very important to us, the four noble truths, right? We call them the noble truths because they're not ordinary. They're not connected with the ordinary things of this world. But the Supreme Buddha says, these, these ordinary sights, even these excellent sights connected with a wheel-turning mana, they're still just ordinary things to go and see. When you go and see uh, Niagara Falls, right, you're very excited. It takes a while to drive there. You get there, you see it, and how long do you, do you look at it? Maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, and then you turn around and you say, well, what else is there? Right? And you're not the only one that does that because you do look around and you see that they've got museums and movie theaters and a butterfly zoo. Like they've got all sorts of things because everybody goes there wanting to see the big sight. And then they see it and they realize, well, you know, that's a lot of water. That's pretty big. But I'm not really any better off than I was before. Maybe there's something down the street that will help me out, right? That will bring me more happiness. Right? So you go down the street and you see the butterfly exhibit, you know, pay a lot of money, and, and yes, you've seen some amazing butterflies, and then you say, well, okay, I'm still not really happy. Right? So these are ordinary things. They don't help us put an end to this round of samsara. They don't make our mind peaceful. They just make us want to see more things. Right? None of these ordinary things can put an end to our craving for sights. All it does is we collect these, these sights. We say, oh, well, you know, we've heard about this Grand Canyon, this big hole down in America. Maybe if we see that sight, that will be enough. Right? So people travel really far, and they see that, and they say, wow, it's big, but it's just a big hole. Right? It's not really helping me in any way. So this kind of seeing... It's just, it's just an ordinary thing. It's just an ordinary thing. People do it all the time, and it doesn't, it doesn't help them at all. Then the Supreme Buddha says, When, however, one of settled faith, of settled devotion, decided, full of confidence, goes to see the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, this unsurpassed sight is for the purification of beings. So what does that mean, purification of beings? The Supreme Buddha taught us that our mind has many unpure, impure things in it. This is the problem. We take very good care of our bodies. When we, uh, when we wake up in the morning, we wash our bodies. Uh, that's very clear. If we don't wash our bodies, people will tap us on the shoulder and say, you need, to, you need to wash your body. But really, the Supreme Buddha said, the problem is our mind, that we need to clean our mind, that our mind is filled with many unwholesome things that, uh, that leads to us doing all sorts of bad things with our body, with our speech, and with our mind. Our mind is full of greed, full of hatred, full of delusion. And these ordinary sights in the world, they don't help us to purify our mind. But when someone goes to see the Supreme Buddha, they have the chance to listen to the Dhamma, 
and through listening to this Dhamma, they can purify their mind from these unwholesome states. So this unsurpassed sight is for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and dejection, for the achievement of the method. So the Supreme Buddha taught that this sangsara, it's very long and it's full of trouble. It's not just this life that you're having now, living here in a very comfortable city with good houses, good vehicles, things like that. If we knew for sure that each of our lives in, in this round of samsara would be in a comfortable place, a safe country, then we wouldn't have such a big problem. But the Supreme Buddha taught this samsara is full of trouble, full of weeping. This is why it's so important to see these things that are really unsurpassed. So the next time you go to Niagara Falls, you can remember what the Supreme Buddha said about, about the ocean. The Supreme Buddha asked the monks, so monks tell me, which is more? The number of tears, the amount of tears that you've shed running in this long round of samsara, or the water in the four great oceans? And the monks say, Venerable Sir, surely more water has been shed when we cry over losing losing our relatives, losing our friends, our loved ones. So when you go to, to Niagara Falls again, think, all that water, that's just a small part of the ocean. So this unsurpassed scene is for the passing away of pain and dejection. So seeing the Supreme Buddha helps us put an end to this round of samsara for the achievement of the method, so being able to understand this dependent origination that's only taught by the Supreme Buddha. For the realization of Nibbana, this is called the unsurpassed sight. Such is the unsurpassed sight. So we know so many people got to see the Supreme Buddha when he was alive. And sometimes they had faith, and sometimes they did not. Sometimes they, they knew who they were seeing, sometimes they didn't. So we know that the Supreme Buddha, he didn't look like an ordinary person, did he? Even just his physical appearance was so amazing, so excellent because of the merit that he had done in his previous lives, right? He had very beautiful skin, he had beautiful blue eyes, his body was, was very well shaped, he was very handsome. Many people would, just by seeing the Supreme Buddha, would have, have confidence in him. But not everyone uh, had that confidence. Right? We can think about the Brahmin, Magandiya. Remember him? He, he was looking for a, a husband for his daughter. And he saw the Supreme Buddha and he thought, oh, wow, this, he should be my son-in-law. Right? He, he had searched far and wide for, for a husband and passed over many men. But when he saw the Supreme Buddha, he thought, ah, oh, this is this is the one for my daughter. So he, he told the Supreme Buddha, wait here, I'll be right back. So he got his wife and he got his daughter and they went to try and find the Supreme Buddha. But his wife was very wise. She, she noticed some footprints on the ground and she said, look at these footprints. Uh, do these belong to this, to this man that you're talking about, that you're taking us to? And and Magandhya said, yes, that's, those are his footprints. But she was very wise. She knew about these signs of a very special being. And she saw in the footprints that uh, there were wheels. Right? So this is one of the characteristics of a Samasambhuta, that they have these, these Dhamma wheels on their feet. And she saw those in the footprints. And she said, husband, you're very foolish. This man is not going to be your son-in-law. Right? But they searched out the Supreme Buddha. And out of great compassion, he taught them the Dhamma. They were able to, to understand the Dhamma, and both of them became, they entered the order, became monks and nuns. Sometimes, though, people had a, had a very angry mind at seeing the Buddha. We can remember the, the wanderer, Magandhi, right? He even just saw the Supreme Buddha's bed, and he got angry. So we need to be very wise. We need to know what it is that we're seeing when we have this chance to see the Supreme Buddha. 
because if we don't take this opportunity, we'll miss this chance to put an end to the round of samsara. So this is the first, the first sight, or the first uh, unsurpassed thing, this unsurpassed seeing. Remember what the next unsurpassed thing is? Hearing, right, the unsurpassed hearing. So here someone goes to hear the sound of drums, the sound of lutes, guitars, the sound of singing, or to hear various sounds. Or else they go to hear the Dhamma of an ascetic or Brahmin of wrong views, of wrong practice. There is this hearing. So this is the ordinary kind of hearing in the world, going to see musical shows, people singing, hearing uh, teachings from other teachers, teachers who hold wrong views. So this is an ordinary kind of scene. We can think about uh, the two very good friends, Upatisa and Kolita, remember them? So they went to see some, some ordinary sounds. Do you remember who they were? This was uh, the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Mahamo Galana before they became monks. They, they were very good friends and they would, they would enjoy themselves uh, together. They went to, to see this festival on the top of a mountain that had all these sorts of ordinary sounds, all these sorts of ordinary things to listen to. And on the first day they enjoyed listening to these sounds. They enjoyed these ordinary things. But after a few days, they got very bored with them. Not only that, they thought, you know, this, this isn't helping us. They had that, that little bit of wisdom to think, this, we're not getting anywhere with this, right? There's just music day after day. It doesn't really help us. It doesn't help us put an end to this round of samsara. Why don't we go and try and listen to something that will help us? So they went and they, they visited many teachers, many teachers of wrong views. So they went from one kind of ordinary hearing to another kind of ordinary hearing. And they followed a teacher whose teachings weren't helping them either. And so finally, they decided they needed to, to split up. They needed to go out searching to try and find a teacher who really could help them put an end to this round of samsara. So we remember, eventually they did find a disciple of the Supreme Buddha, the Venerable uh, Asaji. And Upatisa uh, approached him and he could see that this monk was not an ordinary human being. Right? So first he had this seeing, and then because he saw this monk, he had the chance to hear the Dhamma. Just, just a short stanza, just one short stanza he heard, and this was enough to help him attain stream entry. So this was the unsurpassed hearing, the unsurpassed listening, this listening to the Dhamma that we have the chance to do when we, when we see the Supreme Buddha, or the disciple of the Supreme Buddha. So the Blessed One goes on to say that this ordinary kind of, of hearing doesn't help us put an end to this round of samsara. He says, this hearing is low, common, worldly, ignoble, unbeneficial. It does not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, so what does this mean? Disenchantment, dispassion. When we say that, that music is enchanting, what does that mean? It means it totally takes our mind away. Whatever problems we were thinking about before, all we can think about is this beautiful, beautiful music. It's like casting a spell on us. But when the music stops, all our thoughts come back. All of our problems come right back. But because it's enchanting, it, it connects us to this round of samsara. We want more and more of it. We think, oh, when I die, I hope I'm reborn somewhere where I can listen to, to this beautiful, beautiful music. So it keeps us bound to this samsara. So this ordinary hearing does not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. When, however, one of settled faith, of settled devotion, decided, full of confidence, goes to hear the Tathagata 
or a disciple of the Tathagata. This unsurpassed hearing is for the purification of beings. So when someone does have the chance to hear the teachings of the Supreme Buddha, this does help them to purify their minds. Uh, for the overcoming of sorrow, lamentation, for the passing away of pain and dejection. So we remember, it's not just in this life that the pain stops, that it's putting an end to this round of samsara, that, that when someone hears the Dhamma and they attain this first stage of, of enlightenment, sotapanna, then they know they'll never be reborn in bad destinations, in the ghost world, in the animal realm, in the hell realms. So it's this Dhamma that truly puts an end to the suffering, to the pain. For the achievement of the method, for the realization of Nibbana, this is called the unsurpassed hearing. Such is the unsurpassed sight and the unsurpassed hearing. So these are the first two. And do you remember the third one? The unsurpassed gain. The unsurpassed gain. So first, the Supreme Buddha tells us what, what the ordinary gains are. He says here, someone gains a son, a wife, or wealth, or they gain various goods, or else they obtain faith in an ascetic or Brahmin of wrong views, of wrong practice. There is this gain. This I do not deny. So we can very easily think about all the things that we can gain in this world, can't we? We can gain children. We can gain a husband, gain a wife all the material things in this world. The Supreme Buddha said, these are definitely a gain. He even said that there's some happiness that comes from these things, didn't he? He never said that, that sensual pleasures weren't enjoyable. He said, indeed, sensual pleasures are very enjoyable. If they weren't enjoyable, then people wouldn't get attached to them. Then we wouldn't have this problem of samsara. But in fact, there are these things that we gain, and they do bring some degree of happiness. And, of course, many people develop confidence in many sorts of teachers, many religions, many teachings, many philosophies. But the Supreme Buddha says, these are very ordinary. This is a very ordinary kind of confidence. He says that, that these gains, that this ordinary kind of confidence in, in other teachers, it's not connected with superior things. It's just connected with ordinary things in this world. You don't need to have any special knowledge to, to gain these ordinary things. Then the Supreme Buddha says, but when someone who has settled faith settled devotion, decided, full of confidence, obtains faith in the Tathagata or in the disciple of the Tathagata. This unsurpassed gain is for the purification of beings. So the Supreme Buddha said, the really excellent kind of gain is when we gain sadha, when we gain faith in the enlightenment of the Supreme Buddha. Because when we gain faith in the enlightenment of the Supreme Buddha, then we listen to the teachings very carefully. If we don't have confidence in the enlightenment of the Supreme Buddha, we won't pay attention. We won't, we won't take the risk of trying to put these teachings into practice. Think about what the Supreme Buddha is telling us. He's saying all these things, all these gains in the world, they're not going to bring you lasting happiness. So we have to, we have to trust the Supreme Buddha because the happiness that they do bring us we can experience that for ourselves very easily. So when we listen to the teachings and the Supreme Buddha says, you know, if you want real happiness, you'll give up these sensual pleasures. You have to have a lot of confidence that he really knows what he's talking about because you're risking this happiness that you're getting right now, this ordinary kind of happiness. You have to have enough confidence that you're willing to put these teachings into practice. Sometimes it's very difficult to put the teachings into practice. Keeping the precepts in this world can be very difficult. You know, here we're very lucky we get to associate with many people who follow the precepts, who respect the precepts, 
who admire people who follow the precepts. But in the ordinary world, people don't care so much about the precepts. They think, well, whatever you have to do to, to take care of yourself, that's all that really matters. Whatever you have to do to take care of your family, that's what's most important. If you have to you know, tell some lies, cheat a little bit, as long as your family's well taken care of, that's what's most important. Right? This is the ordinary knowledge in the world. And people have confidence in that ordinary sort of knowledge. But that's not the sort of knowledge that helps put an end to this round of samsara. But when someone does have faith in the enlightenment of the Supreme Buddha, then they have confidence in this Dhamma. They know that it really is the way to bring happiness. So then the fourth is the unsurpassed training. The Supreme Buddha says, here someone trains in elephantry, in horsemanship, in chariotry, in archery, swordsmanship, or they train in various fields. So these were the types of jobs that were very important in the time of the Supreme Buddha. Being able to, to train an elephant, to take a wild elephant and be able to to ride on it, to use it for building things, to train horses, uh, training in archery, all sorts of things that were important in the time of the Supreme Buddha. We also have training uh, now, don't we? People have to, to train how to drive a car. You have to train for your job. There's all sorts of training in the world. The other kind of training that the Supreme Buddha talks about as being ordinary is the training under ordinary teachers, teachers of wrong view. So the Supreme Buddha says, this is a kind of training. Right? Of course, this is a way that, that people learn things, they learn how to do things. This is a kind of training. But he says, this training, it's not connected with with what's high, what's really beneficial. It's connected with, with ordinary things, with worldly things. Right? We can think, why do, we, why do people train for jobs? They train for jobs so they can make money, so they can get this ordinary kind of gain, so they can get this ordinary kind of seeing things, so they can hear ordinary, ordinary kinds of things. So the Supreme Buddha says, this kind of training it's not the kind of training that puts an end to the round of samsara. But there is a kind of training that will help us. A training that's not connected with the ordinary world. The Supreme Buddha says, when, however, one of settled faith, of settled devotion, decided, full of confidence, trains in the higher virtuous behavior, the higher mind, and the higher wisdom, in the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata. This is the unsurpassed training. So earlier, you got to hear about the training specifically. How someone hears the Supreme Buddha's teaching. Right? So it's connected with these other, these other unsurpassed things. That's what's nice about these unsurpassed things, is that they're related to one another. When you get to see the Supreme Buddha, then you get to hear the Supreme Buddha's Dhamma. When you get to hear the Supreme Buddha's Dhamma, then you get to gain this excellent faith, this faith that helps you practice these teachings. So this is, this is what would happen in the time of the Supreme Buddha. And it even happens now that people, they, they go to see the Supreme Buddha, they hear the Supreme Buddha's teaching. They develop confidence in this teaching. They get uh, a degree of faith that allows them to investigate further. And then they undertake the training. So what do they do? They have to, to shave off their hair and beard. They put on these robes. They give up all the things that they had in their household life. Their, their money, if they had a lot of money, if they had a little money, they have to give it all away. Then they train in the precepts. They train not killing living beings, not stealing, not telling lies. They, they refine their speech. They, they don't use harsh speech. They try and speak very gentle words. 
They don't use their words to divide people from each other. They don't use useless speech. They don't, um, they don't use money. So monks and nuns stop using money altogether. They don't engage in any kind of businesses. They don't run messages for people. It would be in the time of the Supreme Buddha, you know, these monks uh, wandered all around the country. And so it would be very easy for people to say, oh, Bhante, you're going to such and such a place. I have a friend there. Can you take this, this message to them? Right? Terrible way to get caught up with people. So these, uh, these monks, they would have to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do it. You'll have to pay someone. Send someone, send someone else in your message. So even in these subtle, little subtle ways, the Supreme Buddha, this excellent training, allowed people to, to really step away from society, not get caught up in these little details, right? Because say a monk goes on this, this errand and they get the message wrong, right? And then something bad happens because of that and then they go try and find the monk and you know, complain to the monk. Terrible, terrible. So this excellent teaching, this excellent training of the Supreme Buddha. Mm -hmm. This practice of not, mm -hmm. monks and nuns, not making their own food, you know, not growing their own food, only being allowed to eat what it is that people give them that very day. Would any of us have had that idea to think that this is the right way to, to train our minds? No, we would never come up with that, right? Because it's very difficult. You're completely dependent on other people. And you don't get to choose what it is that, that you get to eat every day. That's, for ordinary people, that's just a common thing. Whatever you want to eat, if you can afford it, then you, you get to eat that. But the Supreme Buddha gave us this excellent training of just eating whatever it is that's given to us. Would people on their own decide to do that? No. You have to have this excellent kind of seeing, this excellent kind of hearing this excellent gain of faith in the Supreme Buddha, to be willing to train in this way, this training that, that really goes against all of our natural, all of our natural instincts. So this is the, the Supreme Buddha's training. And part of this training you're doing today, aren't you? By not eating after 12, right? sitting on very uh, simple cushions, um, practicing meditation, so there's this, this virtue aspect of the training, and there's also the higher mental development, developing the jhanas, developing the, the higher knowledges. This is all part of the Supreme Buddha's training, understanding dependent origination. If you go down the street to the technical college, are they going to teach you about dependent origination? Can you get a certificate in dependent origination here at the colleges? No, no. They'll teach you very ordinary things that will help you to gain other very ordinary things. But you need to come to a special place to hear the Supreme Buddha's Dhamma, to get this excellent kind of training. So this is the, the fourth. The fifth one is the unsurpassed service. So the Supreme Buddha says that there's all kinds of ordinary service in the world. People can offer service to a king, to a Brahmin, uh, to a householder, or they serve ordinary teachers, teachers who have wrong views. So he says, this indeed, it is a kind of service. It is a way of serving people. But this kind of service doesn't lead to the ending of greed, the ending of hatred, the ending of delusion. So when you, uh, when you follow a teacher that that has wrong views, you start to believe their wrong views and then you start to act in a way that, that goes along with those wrong views. So some, some teachers, they taught that this, this life, it's of a fixed length, that, that each, each living being will only live for a certain amount of time. They'll be reborn, but only for a certain amount of time. They say it's just like a, a ball of string that you you know, take a ball of string at the top of a mountain and you, you let it unravel, rolling down the hill, and eventually the string runs out. So they teach that eventually this round of samsara comes to an end, whether you do anything or not. So 
when someone serves a teacher like that, they start to, they start to believe this. And if someone believes that, that samsara is of a fixed length, that eventually we'll be okay, eventually it'll come to an end without, without us doing anything, are we going to, to work hard to purify our minds? Will we practice morality? No. No. This is the ordinary, ordinary kind of service. But the Supreme Buddha said, there's this other kind of service, that when someone who has confidence, who has settled faith, they serve the Supreme Buddha or they serve a disciple of the Supreme Buddha, that this kind of service helps put an end to the round of samsara. So we can think about, um, do you remember the story of um, Sumana, the flower, flower gatherer? So he was out one day and he had the chance to, to see the Supreme Buddha. And he was one of those people that as soon as he saw the Supreme Buddha, he knew that this was not an ordinary being. But he was very poor. And all he had to offer as a service to the Supreme Buddha was to give him the flowers that he had collected. But he had a problem. The flowers, they were already spoken for because he worked for the king. So he had this ordinary kind of service. He was working for the king to bring the king flowers. So each day he would bring the king a basket full of flowers. So he's standing there on the road. He has this chance to see the Supreme Buddha. He has this chance to offer something to the Supreme Buddha. So he has to think, King, Supreme Buddha. King, Supreme Buddha. Now, many people are very afraid of kings because a king, they can do whatever they want to. They can kick you out of the country. They can make you pay a fine. The kings can even have you killed. If, if you do something that they don't like. So this wasn't, uh, this wasn't just a simple decision for him to make. He really, there, there might have been bad consequences. This is what he, he was thinking in his mind. But he thought, you know, I have this chance to offer something to the Supreme Buddha. It doesn't matter. I may not get this chance again for a very long time in this round of samsara. So he thought, no matter what the king does, it doesn't matter. I'll have made this offering to the Supreme Buddha. So he offered his flowers to the Supreme Buddha. Then he went back home and he told his wife what he had done. And his wife was very scared. She didn't get a chance to see the Supreme Buddha. Maybe if she had seen the Supreme Buddha, she would have understood. But she didn't get a chance to, to see the Supreme Buddha. She didn't have confidence in the Supreme Buddha. So. She was very scared. All she could think about was what the king was going to do to them. So do you remember what she did? She went to the king and she said, whatever my husband did, I don't have any part of it. I'm not responsible for that. Right? He does his own thing. Uh, you can punish him if you want, but don't, don't do anything to me. It wasn't my idea. So who was this king? It was King Bimbisara. So. Was King Bimbisara going to punish this, this flower gatherer? No. Why? Because he was a Sotapanna. He got the chance to see the Supreme Buddha. He saw the Supreme Buddha even before the Supreme Buddha attained enlightenment. Do you remember what happened when he saw the Supreme Buddha? Even then, before the Supreme Buddha had attained enlightenment, he was willing to share his kingdom right, with this person that he had never met before. But he saw and he thought, this is not an ordinary person. I would be better off having this person helping me rule the kingdom. But the Supreme Buddha, he didn't want kingdoms. He already had one that he had gotten rid of. So uh, when the Supreme Buddha did attain enlightenment, he came back and taught uh, the king. So the king, of course, was very happy that Sumana had made this offering. And he rewarded uh, Sumana very well with ordinary things. But because Sumana had the chance to, to make this service to the Supreme Buddha, he got to hear the Supreme Buddha's teaching. So when we, when, we do this, uh, when we do this service, we have this excellent chance when we serve the right people. We can also remember there was a, uh, an Upasaka who was serving the monks. He was a very old man, but he was very, very humble, very gentle, 
and he, he did whatever the monks needed them to do. And eventually one day he decided that he, he wanted to become a monk. But he was very old and a lot of the times monks, they're not so keen on ordaining people who are very old because it's a very difficult life and uh, it's hard to take care of people uh, when they get old. So oftentimes monks will be reluctant to ordain someone who's very old. Sometimes also when people are very old, they're very stuck in their habits and they're, it's hard for them to undertake the training. Sometimes uh, if someone ordains when they're very old, their senior monks will be younger than their own children, right? young enough to be their grandchildren. And so they get, they get bothered when these young, young boys try and correct them. But this man, he was very, very keen to ordain. And so eventually, when the other monks wouldn't ordain him, he went to the Supreme Buddha and said, please, can't you have the monks ordain me? And so the Supreme Buddha asked, so does anyone remember any service that this, that this man has done for you? And the monks had, they had to admit, yes, he actually has done things for us. The Venerable Sariputta says, yes. I remember he did, he has performed services for me. And the Sar Venerable Sariputta, uh, he had this very rare quality of gratitude in the world. The Supreme Buddha said, it's hard to find people with gratitude. But the Venerable Sariputta, he had gratitude for the service that was done. So because this man had, had done this service, the Venerable Sariputta was able to, was willing to ordain him. And so because of that, this, uh, this man who became a monk was eventually able to attain enlightenment, to completely put an end to this round of samsara. So when someone serves a noble individual, a tathagata or the disciple of the tathagata, then this kind of service is what leads them to put an end to the round of samsara. No matter how long you serve a king, no matter how long you serve the, the president, the prime minister, that kind of service, it won't help you to remove your greed, your hatred, delusion. You might even increase your greed, increase your hatred, increase your delusion. So what are the, so far, what are the different unsurpassed things that we've learned about? The unsurpassed sight, the unsurpassed hearing, the unsurpassed gain, the unsurpassed, and the unsurpassed service, right? Do you remember the last unsurpassed thing? Recollection, the unsurpassed recollection. So the Supreme Buddha teaches us. And how is there the unsurpassed recollection? Here, someone recollects the gain of a son, a wife, or wealth, or else they recollect various kinds of gain, or else they recollect an ascetic or Brahmin of wrong views, of wrong practice. So when people gain ordinary things, they like to think about them. When they're at work, they think about all the things that they have waiting for them at home, their children, their husbands, their wives, their big television, who knows what people have at home, but they remember those things when they're separated from them. The Supreme Buddha says, this is a kind of, of recollection, remembering these things, and remembering teachers who are ordinary teachers. People recollect them as well. But this kind of recollection, it doesn't really help us. When we recollect all the things that we own, it really just increases the greed that we have for them. We can also think about in the, the Jagga Sutta, right? that's also about uh, recollection. And we get to learn about this ordinary kind of recollection. Do you remember what happens in that sutta? So the, uh, the gods are, are going into battle and Saka says, so if you get afraid, when we're fighting, remember, just look up at, at my flag. And then when you look at that flag, your fear will go away. You'll think, oh, Saka, he's, he's such a great warrior. And you won't be afraid. If you can't remember to look at my flag, then look at uh, Pajapati's flag. 
Look at Varuna's flag, Isana's flag. So if you look at these flags, then you won't be afraid. But is this really the way to get rid of our fear? No. The Supreme Buddha said, people, these, these devas, when they look at those flags, maybe their fear will go away, maybe it won't. Maybe they'll have confidence, maybe they won't. Why is that? Because these gods, they haven't completely eradicated fear. They haven't eradicated hatred. They haven't eradicated delusion. But instead, if you recollect the Supreme Buddha, the Supreme Dhamma, and the Supreme Sangha, this is the kind of recollection that can, can help you get rid of your fear. You can remember, there is a being in the world who's removed all of their defilements, has purified their mind completely. It's very easy when we go about our lives, when our mind is full of defilements, full of greed, full of hatred, full of delusion. It's hard to imagine sometimes that a being could exist that doesn't have these, these problems in their mind, these shortcomings, these weaknesses. But instead, the Supreme Buddha said, you need to recollect the Supreme Buddha, that when you do this, your mind will become peaceful. It will help you put an end to passion. So when you're obsessed with, with the bad things that someone has done to you, your mind is overcome with anger, and you recollect the Supreme Buddha, you think he was a being who didn't have any anger. No matter what anyone did to him, he didn't get angry. People could come and attack him with words, even attack him physically, and he still didn't get angry. Why, why don't I try and be like that? It's possible. There's happiness when I try and, and imitate these great arahants. The Supreme Buddha says, this is the unsurpassed recollection for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and dejection. So when we recollect the Supreme Buddha, our, our sadness will go away. Not only that, it will help us concentrate our mind. It will help us on the path to completely put an end to the round of samsara. So this is called the unsurpassed recollection. Then the Supreme Buddha recited some excellent verses to summarize the sutta, to help us remember what he's taught us. He says, having gained the best of sights, and the unsurpassed hearing, having acquired the unsurpassed gain, delighting in the unsurpassed training. So this is very beautiful, delighting in the unsurpassed training. Right? Can ordinary people delight in this very difficult training that the Supreme Buddha has given us? Do ordinary people delight in, in not eating during half the day, in eating whatever kind of food people give to them? Right? making do with, with very simple kinds of clothing. So the Supreme Buddha says, they delight in this training. It's really nice to think about. They're attentive in service. They develop recollection connected with seclusion, secure, leading to the deathless. Rejoicing in heedfulness, prudent, so wise, restrained by virtue, in time, they realize where it is that suffering ceases. Sad, sad, sad. Thank you.